put on by the Nebraska Chamber and Development Group. I am Paula Falconer, Community Relations Coordinator for Mahaska Health and a board member of the Mahaska Chamber. We want to thank the following businesses for making today's event possible. Midwest One Bank for sponsoring the coffee, Smokey Row for the use of the facility, George Gailey Auditorium, Andy and Allison McGuire for setting up the sound. We would also like to thank all the local media that is here covering this morning. And we also want to thank the American Legion who will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Some opening comments from them, and then we'll go over some of the ground rules. You guys can start. Go ahead, David. Here. Here's a microphone. I assume this is the one we need. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, great to be here again. Better weather than last Saturday, so uh, no fog and no snow. And nice weather. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeff Hoffman. I'm the Chamber of Commerce and Impact with. Uh, I've been fortunate to serve uh, Austin and, and Mahaska County going to the to be uh, for the last two years, and thank you for this morning. Thank you. My name is Mark Nip McCullough, and I live in Pella, and I have Marion County, a little bit of Jasper County, and a little bit of Mahaska County. So I uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I have a variety of different committees, so workforce, commerce, um, ways and means, and also economic development and IT. My name is Helena Hayes. I represent District 88 in the Iowa House. I share Mahaska County with Barb. I have all of Keokuk County and just the rural part of Jefferson County. So I have like six pages of notes I made for today. We could be here all day. We have so much to talk about. Just one day this week, we had 60 subcommittees in the House. Um, we have a, an awesome country and an awesome state to fight for, and we have a lot to do. So thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of this conversation. Good morning, everyone. Senator Ken Rosenbaum. Uh, and as a lot of you know, this is my 12th year up here. Um, and it's good to be back. Just a brief review. Barb and I have western part of Mahaska County. We have much of Marion County, and I have all of Jasper County. Barb has part of it. 
Uh, my committee assignments remain the same as last year. Uh, Ag and Natu or Natural Resources and Environment Committee, which I've been on for 12 years. The Agriculture Committee, I've been on for 12 years. Transportation Committee and Education. In Education, I serve as the chair, and that's uh, that can be a heavy load. That's one of those major committees that gets a lot of a lot of work. And I think we've had I don't know 40 or 50 bills filed so far this year in my committee. Uh, I want to set the table a little bit in terms of. The governor gave her condition of the state address, but I think it's important that we review how we're doing in Iowa, because there's really some good news. The biggest single thing we do every year is pass a balanced budget. Our budget is in good shape in Iowa. Our cash reserve fund is full at $720 million. Our economic um, emergency fund is full at $240 million. The Revenue Estimating Conference is projecting a, a year-end balance of $2.144 billion, and the Taxpayer Relief Fund carries a balance of over $3 billion. So we're in very good shape, checkbooks uh, in good shape, and the emergency funds are fully funded. Uh, and in addition to that, it's not always about money, it's quality of life. Iowa is in a good place relative to our states around us. We're number one state in which to retire, according to some rankings. We're number one for fiscal responsibility. That feels good. We're number one for millennial homeowners. We're number two, we have the number two best healthcare system in the country. Number two, or number three state for opportunity. Number six for most affordable states. So we hear all these comparisons to other states, but in terms of what we pay and, and, and that sort of thing, but Iowa is a very affordable state. Number six for labor participation. Number seven rated best state overall. So we're in good shape in Iowa. Um, and it's my intention certainly to keep us there, maybe even improve. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a few ground rules to, uh, before we get started. First off, uh, I think a lot of you have already been here before, but in case you haven't, uh, this is an open forum. I'll be walking around. People can uh, make comments, uh, ask questions of the legislators. I'll hold on to the microphone. When I come up to you, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and then also where you're from. Uh, that, that's important because the rest of the people in the group want to know what's your perspective, uh, where are you coming from, basically. Uh, we do ask that, you know, be polite. You know, if, if you're trying to uh, uh, get people to agree with you, it works a lot better than getting mad at them. Uh, then every now and then we have somebody who says, I've got a prepared statement. And then they, they get started reading it, and I'm going to use my own word here, they drone on on and on. Time's important here. We only have one hour. And so from that perspective, now keep it short. Uh, the rest of the group, you're going to lose uh, people every five seconds if you get started reading some sort of statement. And then finally, we've had one occasion where a bunch of protesters got up and disrupted the event. Are there any protesters here today? <laughs> if so, we want to get that started now. <laughs> Who we are. Get it there. Get it there. Okay. You don't have well, with that in mind, who would like to start us off? Well, wait a minute. Surprise. I have all the time. 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 That is helpful for a lot of people to ask questions as to who you're really directing that to. So, among the ways and means committee, that's usually a taxation issue. Um, I'm on uh, Commerce, uh, uh, Vice Chair of Transportation, and the Chairman of the Workforce Committee. Can I say my two? Say? Oh, I forgot my two, just so you guys know. That is important because this is where we spend a lot of time. So I have Natural Resources, Environmental Protection, and International Relations. International Relations is very fun because I get to meet a lot of the dignitaries and the uh, groups that are coming from all over. Kosovo is one of our sister states right now, and they were here last year. Natural resources is always is fascinating because we talk a lot about raccoons. So if you have a raccoon question today, please see me. Um, and of course, deer. So thank you. 
Uh, good morning, all. Eric Palmer, thank you for being here. I just have a couple of brief notes here. Um, you had a special session after all these um, coffee and, and conversation meetings were over, and it was on the subject of abortion. And uh, you met uh, a special session, and I think in two days you passed a six week ban. Now, I understand that ban is not in place yet. Apparently, the court is reviewing it. Uh, but I think all of you voted for it. And my real question is, and I do have it written down so I get the exact wording I want, will any of you introduce, sponsor, or vote for a bill totally banning abortion in Iowa if uh, the Iowa Supreme Court votes in your favor? Correct, and Eric, it was a one day session, not a two day. It didn't take us long. The question is, uh, vote, vote for a total ban of abortion. Yes, sir. Uh, I haven't thought about it. I, that's not going to happen. I mean, there's no bill to that effect. Uh, I, I guess you're trying to poke the bear, but no. Life. I took an oath to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think. Um, I believe in life at conception. I, I know I believe in life at conception. There's no particular place in which life becomes life, except at the moment that we have a, a fertilized embryo. And so I definitely would move in that direction um, for life. Uh, we don't have anything like Ken said. We have some bills that are working on say, um, talking about fetal development in public schools and in charter schools, and I fully support those. I've signed on to those. I think this is a really very interesting and easy answer. I, I'm in favor of life. I'm afraid of your life, my life, and baby's life in the womb. I agree with you. Life. Good Lord put a man and a woman together to create that new life, and we are to inhabit the earth. Um, there are circumstances where if a mother is in um, dire need that something needs to be done, a DNC, whatever that looks like. Um, but yes, I think the good Lord created life and we need to remember that. Um, first, before any other legislation series, I think we need to see what's going to play out with the courts, uh, what's happening right now. But on the subject in general, um, two years ago, maybe you, maybe you probably recall this, my daughter made a very, very public statement that she was going to cut me out of her life, but if I didn't change my position, my pro-life position. She's very abortion uh, opinionated, and I said, I love you, um, however, and I respect your opinions, I wish you'd respect mine. And she hasn't spoken to me in two years. Okay. I think that tells you where I stand on the issue of law. Ken, Ken I'm not poking the bear. This is a legitimate question. After we were done with our session, sir, you folks went into a one day special session and voted for a six week ban. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you know where you, what you're going to do. This means good. Ask him what his position is. Next question. <clears throat> He's, he, he used to be in the house. He does. My question is, my name is excuse me, Lois Holbrook, Dr. Moss Um What I want to know is, um, can a mother drop her newborn baby off in Oskaloosa without questions being asked? I know this can be done in Des Moines, in several different places. I don't know. That's at Safe Harbor. And Oscaloosa. No, I, it's a Safe Harbor box, is what it is. Like you can drop yeah, it in the police department. Is that called a stuff. Safe Harbor box? Yes. Yes. Safe Haven. Safe Haven. Safe Haven. Box. Safe Haven. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I missed all that. I don't know. In Oscaloosa. You can drop one off at the hospital. Yes. Is that correct, yeah. Paula? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a yes. 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 Um, <laughs> Yeah, and we worked on that last year to expand the sites for that. Sites I'm sorry, I'd have to yeah. research. Just, pardon me, Adrian, you know, 
No, I think we expanded it a year ago. I think the sites and protections. Here. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we expanded it a year ago to add more sites and more protections for the police departments. Yeah, yeah. Right. Police, yeah. Department. police department. Fire department. Fire department. Fire department. Yeah. Yeah. Police department. Yeah. 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 That's true. <laughs> While you're heading over there, whoops, while you're heading over to the mayor, we do have um, a representative from the hospital here, and he does confirm that we do have that. Hi, Kim Norm, and I'm from Oskaloosa. Um, the private company summit is challenging uh, local governments over forcing eminent domain for their carbon pipeline. I'm wondering what is your position about the carbon pipeline and the use of eminent domain for I've never been a fan of the pipeline issue in any form. Um, just the, the basis of what it's on. I'm not a, a believer in this movement you know, per se, and this would drive me so much of it. Uh, I was relieved to see that the pipeline down through this area is saw a different path, and that's a path of stopping, I guess. Um, so, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the other pipelines. I think from here, anyway, it's been resolved, at least for, for some time. I think we need to have make sure that the landowner would like to have something like that come through their property. And if they say yes, I, then why not? I am absolutely opposed to that. I have worked on a, um, with 20, other legislators to, um, we, we uh, testified in the summit case in Fort Dodge this year um, and brought with written and oral testimony. I have um, led our county and district in opposition to this in holding public events on it and making sure that I reach out to landowners, helping them understand these forever easements that this creates and relating that to what is going on internationally and globally with property rights and um, certain entities, WEF, World Economic Forum, WHO, UNESCO, you name them, coming and pressing down into our statehood and, and our, on our national sovereignty. Uh, of course, I don't oppose all pipelines. I think we need pipelines um, for, to transport uh, useful products, but the, when it comes to the carbon pipeline, um, it's a complete false um, lie. So I will not support it. We're working on eminent domain issues in, in the House. We've got a bill that um, our Judiciary Chair and some other attorneys are working to bring about. Um, and I, I just want to apologize for a minute, guys, because I'm a little bit unnerved this morning. I'm going to be quite frank with you. When we this position challenges us, all of us. I do not have a political long history. I have been a mom for 25 years and I've homeschooled my family. And there's some things that I decided that weren't quite right and I got involved in politics. This morning I was up by 7 a.m. on a Zoom call working with other legislators, understanding what priority bills they're bringing forward, where they're at, and on that call, until I'm driving to town today, when I have 13 interrupted phone calls of a private number trying to get through to me to leave me another voicemail <laughs> of hate and full, I mean, to the point he couldn't even speak, and he tripped over his own swear words. So I do not intend to back down on issues that matter to my district and to Iowans because we have a lot of people that are not thinking clearly on, on our sovereignty, on our um, what is right and wrong, moral and unmoral. And um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm trying not to, to be too direct today because it's, it's things like this that happen to us that you don't see behind the, the scenes that I have to confess drive me even more. Um, to work on the things that are right and just for you, that I believe for you. So this is where I want to continue to hear what you believe. So thank you. Kim, I'm going to answer your question in just a minute. But I'm going to go back to 
Dave's comments when we started about the uh, protests. Not all of you, but some of you, I'm sure, were here. You know that I was the target of those protests because of the ag trespass laws and so forth that I've been involved in. I didn't say this in my feel-good statement up front, but I'm going to say it now. Because the first day of this session, I was uh, informed that the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld our laws in Iowa that we passed in 2019 in 2021 to give Iowa farmers protection from San Francisco ad or, uh, activists that break in and steal and destroy property. So I got a really big win. For me, it felt personal, I will admit, and you guys know why. But <coughs> Iowa got a really big win with the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals on Monday, January 9th. Okay, now, Kim, back to you. Um, you would like to have a yes or no answer, a black or white. It doesn't work that way, nothing is quite that way. In the Senate, we've never had a bill to vote on either one way or the other. The problem I have, the question I have, is twofold. First of all, I agree with Helena. I think the whole premise of this carbon stuff is, is flawed. I think, okay, Washington's driving that boat, though, right? And they're putting trillions of dollars out. To, to to get certain behaviors out of people. And it's dividing Iowa, and that ticks me off. <coughs> but to bring it into a focus a little bit, there's two issues I have. Number one, Iowa's had eminent domain laws for many years. The, the developers, and I'm not a recipient of their funds, and I'm not their fan, but the developers complied with Iowa law as they went forward with their business proposal. I have a problem with Iowa, the state, changing the rules in the midstream of a project. And I think that we would be wide open to lawsuits. Don't know where that goes, but we would be violating the law, basically. Okay, that's problem number one. Problem number two. About four decades ago, Iowa sold its birthright. Because we pursued a ethanol industry in Iowa. We said we grew up corn and we need to build an ethanol industry and we're gonna get wealthy doing it, right? That's who we are. Now today in 2024, more than half the corn we grow in Iowa goes to ethanol. We were very successful. Well, good for us, except we didn't know that some big people in Washington and around the world we're going to get on a climate crusade and, and change a bunch of rules and suddenly the Iowa farmer and the Iowa farm economies at risk because we, we're going to get paid well if we capture our carbon. But if we don't, we bring Iowa to its knees economically. So I don't feel very good about promising you or anybody in this room that I'm gonna vote for, I'm gonna to vote to hurt Iowa's economy. That's the dilemma for me. I hope that kind of made sense. Hi, my name is Jackie Jarvis and I'm from Sigourney. And first of all, I just wanna thank all four of you. Thank you for being here and listening to us. I wanna thank you on the AEA bill that has come through, that, it, that has been um, proposed, the governor has proposed, that you didn't just pass it. Thank you for listening to us. This is very important to our rural schools and to our children. I'm here today as a mom. Um, I'm also an educator and I'm also a pastor, so I'm not, you're not getting any swear words out of me, I promise. Um, however, what I really want to tell you about today is about our son, Corey. When Corey was three years old, he was diagnosed with a bilateral hearing loss. Now, if you're like us, we didn't have any clue what that meant and what that would mean for our child as he grew up. But what we did know is that our teachers, general education and special ed teachers, had a system that they could pull in that had the expertise needed that Corey would be able to be successful in school. 
Corey at three, so just so you know what that means is, by the age of 10, Corey would be completely deaf. And he was. At 10 years old, he, had, he received his cochlear implant. Now, we're from Sydney, Iowa. We're a very rural school district. He's the only kid, not only the only kid in the school system with a cochlear implant, the only person in the whole entire county that has a cochlear implant. How is our rural school going to deal with that? Well, when he was three years old, our school called in the AEA, and all of a sudden he has a teacher for the deaf of hard of hearing. He has a speech language pathologist. He has an audiologist and audiometrist. He has a special ed consultant. He has a literacy consultant, a math consultant, a science consultant. He has all the expertise that this three-year-old needs. Now, Corey grew up, and he is now 26 years old. He, is a, he has a four-year degree. He works for an engineering firm out of Cedar Rapids. He's a homeowner at the age of 26. He's very successful, and I am here today to tell you that that is because of the collaborative efforts of the school district and the AEA. You see, the AEA was right in there every single step of the way. I'm going to wrap it up real soon, I promise. Okay. I'm very passionate. And I love you, I feel the same way as When Corey needed assistive technology, he needed to use an FM system where the teacher would wear a microphone around their neck and it would go directly into his cochlear impact. Guess where he got it? The AEA brought it. The district didn't buy that huge piece of equipment. When, when it broke, within two hours, there was somebody there with a replacement. The AEA even gave the batteries for it to the school district. It did not cost the school district for those services. This is a very low incidence disability. There are a lot of kids like Corey, but because of the AEA, he was able to grow and be successful because of all those professionals that the general education and special education teacher had access to through their AEA. If we limit the services of the AEA, if we just limit it to special ed services, where we go to a, where we have to pay for services, the district has to pay for the services. A kid like Corey won't get what he needs. And so I'm here today to beg you, to implore you, don't let these amendments <laughs> just go through. Think about our kids. <clears throat> Think about our rural schools who don't have all of the resources that our urban schools have. Thank you. I'm sorry, tell me your first name again. Kathy. Kathy, I'm sorry. I chair the Senate Education Committee. This is squarely in my lab. Been working on this for months. I, and I thought long and hard how to talk about this today. And I'm going to hit back. I'm going to hit back in the sense that what you just all witnessed was very intentional on your part. It was very intentional to beat the governor to the draw in terms of how we deal with the AEA issue. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try in just a few minutes to lay out what the issue really is. Maybe not what you're seeing, but what I think the issue really is. I have a letter in front of me, a heavily redacted letter. And um, it's addressed. It's addressed to Governor Reynolds, to the Education Senate Education Chair, which is me, to the State of Iowa Department of Education, dated November 17, uh, 2023. It's signed at the bottom by the concerned staff at XYZ. AEA. These are staff members at one of our nine AEAs. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read some of it. It says, We believe we've been 
better off consolidating our resources with another AEA. Our special needs population, Jackie, is strong. Yet, and our, and our people resources to deliver valuable services to students with special needs are strengthened. Yet our administrative resources continue to grow. The letter goes on a couple sentences later. The new district service administrators hired this fall are ill-informed. There is evidence, this is evident in their lack of knowledge of special ed. Training of staff in special education continues to be inconsistent across the agency. New and current employees have minimal training in special ed general practices, evaluation practices, and general service. Uh, general supervision practices. This plays out in school districts all across our agency. IEP teams and child fight teams are really equipped to support special ed. Okay, so to me this letter lays out the need for review on how our system is working. I believe this ADA to be an outlier. I do not think this is Typical of 988. I understand that. But it is one of our AEAs. It's one of them that serves probably 50,000 students, probably spends $50 million. And it's not working very well, is it? So, okay, then now to Jackie's um, plea, which is very similar to probably close to 2,000 emails I received from all over the state. The letter goes on to uh, say this, recent practice in the last few years appears to be throwing more money to keep us quiet. Our salaries are higher than other AEAs and school districts, but at what expense? In a recent meeting held with staff, staff to collect state level data to portray our effectiveness and justification for our work, Licensed employees were requested to document services with, with uh, students and teachers and districts in August, or from August. When the staff explained that retroactive practice would be very difficult to recount, they encouraged staff to, infill, or to inflate and approximate rather than to seek precision, including indicating to estimate on the high side. And don't worry too much about submitting accurate data. I find that to be a problem. In recent meetings with staff, in a threatening tone about budget cuts for AEAs across the state, explained explicitly, explicitly that it is our job to be positive at all times about our organization and portray those roles as positive. It was presented in a pleading, almost threatening tone. And then this last. Uh, the staff shared recent accreditation results and portrayed this as great news. Yeah, we have a difficult time believing this, knowing firsthand how our teams operate on a daily basis. We are not providing the supports and, that districts and families serve, which is the main function of AEAs. We yearn for solid, active, dependable leadership. There is so very much waste here in the AEA with people that are not held accountable. It is a mess in the absence of any consistent oversight. Okay. The reason I read the last half of that, but you're shaking your head. I understand that. The point was we need to mobilize. Last August, the word out, where it went out. The legislature's going to be looking at the AEA system. And, and, and you need to let them know how good a work we're doing. And that's fine, that's fair. And for the most part, they are. I tell everybody, there's a thousand wonderful stories, like Jackie's. But to simply overlook the other elements of this is problematic. And that's what's driving the governor. The governor has 11 grandchildren in Iowa's public schools. One of her daughters is a public school teacher. When I met with her in October to review this, start to review this, she started with, we need to serve Iowa's kids better. But the narrative is, 
We're going to tear all, and she wants to tear all that down. That we're, we're going to take away these services. It's absolutely not, not true. That's what you've been told. The truth is we want to spend the money on serving children, special needs and general, in a much more effective way. This letter obviously points to one of the more egregious situations, but we have, this is a $529 million enterprise in Iowa. Every one of you in this room, 165 of your tax dollars goes every year to support this system. They do great work, but we need to be doing it well. And uh, the governor's system or plan, proposed plan, doesn't do away with those services. It does change the structure. It changes it in the sense that right now, I use, we're in Oskaloosa, I use Oskaloosa. Oskaloosa School Board receives, I don't know, I think about $1.2 million every year for special ed and other services that you associate with the AEA. They don't keep a dime of that. They send it right on directly to the AEA. The AEA then in turn provides a bundle of services to support the schools, whether that's your son's, Corey's uh, needs, or, or it's a speech pathologist, or it's a literacy specialist, or whatever it is. There's this bundle of goods that comes back to the Oscars Community School District. But in my mind, there's no there's no way to establish the 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 one point to the value of the one point two million against the services received. So we, the governor's proposing that money goes right to the school. They can go right on and send it on the AEA again if they want to. And, or they can hire uh, and house people, or they can send it, uh, or they can hire private uh, providers. So that's enough. I'm just trying to lay out the groundwork what we're trying to do here. Can I just make one last little comment? When I'm talking about low incidence disabilities, like a student that is deaf, those services are not widely available across we're, the state. We're not of dismantling Iowa. the system. We have like nine of those services across the whole state. We're of not Iowa. dismantling that. So <laughs> I don't serve on the education board. Any okay, bill that's right right before right it sees my eyes will be, you know, through subcommittees and committees. It's a long process before I ever look at it. Okay, I'm looking at the issue more from a businessman standpoint. Okay, if there's any department in the state of Iowa that any of you think that has, I mean, you realize the AA budget every year is half a billion, half a billion dollars. It's been 50 years since any strong look has been taken at the system. If you're telling me that any other department in the state of Iowa that has a half a billion dollars that hasn't been reviewed at this level in 50 years, and you don't want to look at it, and I'm telling you, I won't even consider looking at it to see if the money's being spent right, if we can improve things. If I told you I wasn't willing to do that, every one of you should vote my butt out against your seat. Okay? Vote me out of here if I'm not willing to look at it. And that's what's so damn upsetting with this issue, is, as Ken said, people have been coming after us left and right on the thought of looking at the system. Okay? Nothing's been voted on. We saw the governor's proposal. She's changed it drastically. Okay? But there was a ton of a process before anything were to happen, if it's to happen. Okay? But I'm looking at it from just the dollars. You know, when we look at this AA system, I look at our local, our local AA. There's 72 people that have a compensation package over $100,000 annually. There's 173 people that have compensation packages for over $90,000 a year annually. There's 53 people that have compensation packages higher than anybody, including any owner in my business with 100 employees. Okay? That's a company that has millions of dollars invested in the business. What I'm getting at is over the years, the compensation in a lot of these have increased. If, if we can't look at nine different ADAs and say, is it reasonable to make a question if we can combine some administration services 
lower those costs and oh wow, have some money to buy, or excuse me, to hire more educators to get into school to work with the kids. I mean, how is that not responsible? To at least look at the question. I mean, that just blows me away how people don't even see that as a reasonable question for a legislator to take a look at. Um, from the schools, we get a lot of emails against it. I've got a lot of emails in support of this, and a lot of them from the schools. They complain that they lose some of their best teachers every year to the EAs. They can't compete with the pay scale. They can't compete with it's, it's fewer days to work, less, I mean, just a lot of schools can't compete, and they're losing teachers to it. And a lot of school boards complain that their administrative pay for their superintendents and their principals is elevated because of the offset of what, what the, the comparable is to the administration that holds up the ADAs. And so it is affecting everything. So to not take a look at the system and question whether we should make improvements and leave stuff that's working fine is long for a legislature to not be saying that. Okay, so um, on the ADAs, it's spending thousands more than the national average for pupil with poor results. The nation's report card from 17, 19, and 22, the NAEP scores, I don't know if you guys know what that is, Iowa students with disabilities rank 30th or worse <coughs> on nine of 12 assessments. And Iowa is the only state, the only state that requires all school districts pay into an education support agency, which is the AEAs. And also for 50 years, um, for being too big, the AEAs employ six times more staff than the DEs, and the AEAs own at least 54 properties. 54 properties. Why do we need 54 properties across Iowa for a small state that we are? Too expensive. AEA's annual budget, which you already commented on, 529 million. Um, and the chief total compensation is 309,000 roughly for the top person. Uh, only 62.8% of AEA funds are focused on special ed. Don't want to interrupt. I want to interrupt you real quick. It's 309,000 times nine. Yes. There's nine yes, because there's nine people. Making 309,000. So um, that's and just... And compare that to the here, governor. Go ahead. Sorry. You're taking it. And, and that's where I really get hot. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, 309,000 is the average compensation package of the nine AEA. Directors, chief lady, I'm sorry you shake your head. No, it is. Let me show you the numbers. That's what yeah, it is. That's the average. They, that's the average. Mm -hmm. Our governor makes 130000 a year. Now, the one question I've asked to everybody, and I put my new look last week, someone can justify to me how a, a, a chief administrator, we got nine of them, deserves three times more compensation than what our governor makes. I just, that number from a business standpoint for me doesn't add up. I don't fault the, the chief ministers. I don't fault the HR people that are making over 200000 I don't fault any of them for taking the compensation. I mean, who here wouldn't take higher money as your employer will give it to you? I don't fault, fault, fault them. It's the system that's allowing it to happen. So, sorry, yeah. I didn't interrupt good. you. No, I'm glad you did. Um, so basically, the AEA system, we want to change it to empower the schools is really what we want to do and to be able to have choices. And combined, AAs are not going away. They're not going away. No matter what you hear, they are not going away. And we thank Ken for all his leadership in the Senate and what he's doing, the governor, and what we have that she is doing. She's listened to this for years from these people. And when we finally got ready to do something, now all this pushback about Oh my gosh, no we can't, we shouldn't be. And that's all she heard, was we need to do something about this. But it's not to get rid of AEAs. Please, hear what Kenna said and everybody else said. It's not to get rid of them, they serve a purpose. My secretary has used their services for many years. And that son too is out of the school system now and she can't say enough good things about what the AEAs also did for her son. <clears throat> but there's this fear that's going on out there that anytime there's a change, 
And we're trying to make it for the better. Really, we are trying to make it for the better. For the stories like yours and for the stories of my secretaries. So just wait. Just give us the opportunity. Give us the chance. But please, don't not tell us what's going on out there, the good and the bad. Because we do need to know that when we make judgment calls. It's for small businesses, too. We need to know, and then we have to weigh it and see what happens. So we appreciate this opportunity to be able to tell you a little bit about what we see and what's going on. Do I comment? I do want to comment. With all due respect to my Senator Dickey and to Senator Rosenboom and my fellow um, House member here, I am not in favor of this bill. I do not agree with the manner by which it was done. <laughs> Every stakeholder that I've spoke to feels like they were left out of the conversation. They have not been able to have input. And even though we have said it's been going on for a long time, for months, we've been working on this forever, I'm not in that conversation either. Um, I have been talking to a lot of people, including my superintendents from my district. They do not want to keep the pastor funds, uh, for the most part. For the most part. They would keep portions of it that they would like. So, that's what we're trying that's to do. That's what we're they trying to do. to do. Yeah. I know. They I don't agree. have that choice right now. Right. They don't have the choice to keep the pastor well, funds right now. So if they could have that choice, would they keep them? And I'm getting a no from my superintendents unless they keep a portion of it. Some things like saying, um, uh, I can't remember which sections they said. So here's what I'm asking of people, okay? We all acknowledge there's room for improvement, okay? That's what they are saying. There's room for improvement in this system. We also acknowledge that there are solutions to this. There has to be practical solutions. But what we don't agree on is that this has to slow down, okay? It has moved way too fast. People do not feel heard. <clears throat> and it should not be done in this session. So we are listening. We have a lot of disagreement in our body, in the Republican body themselves, I would say. So I know a lot of you, I've had people say to me, well, all you do is you just march to the beat of the governor, right? <laughs> I don't, and, and I'm not saying they do either, but when it comes to opposition to the carbon pipeline, no. When it comes to the, the ADA stuff, I'm a no. And so I encourage you, what I need from you guys is are the practical solutions. Please critically look at what really is going on in our ADAs. Where have the balls been dropped? And where they are, then we fix those. We don't need to. It has been definitely a bit of a demolishing um, bill. And kind of, I like to suggest it's like you find your, you find your um, faucet leaking, and so you just demolish the whole house and you start over. So you still have a house, but it's just all different and you fix the faucet. So I think I, I encourage you guys to, to give those solutions, identify the problems. Don't be afraid to identify the problems and to come out against those, that's fine. We have whistleblowers, that's what he's saying. We have whistleblowers and they're upset. But overwhelmingly, I have nothing, I have heard nothing but support for the ADA. I have had a few people who have said, yeah, we had a really rotten individual, you know, from the AA. She really, she really didn't do her job very well. So we got another one. And, and she was great. And then we got another one, and she sucked. <laughs> you know? So, of course there's going to be various um, services in here. Of course people aren't going to be as good as others. But let's fine-tune it more carefully. And, and, and I do want to acknowledge, there is a lot of fear going around. And this is very typical, you guys, with a lot of bills we have. There was a lot of fear on the AEAs that it was going to break down all the public schools and people were going to flee. And, and so don't listen to the fears, but, but dig into the nitty-gritty of what is really being done in those bills and the why. Always ask the why. Why do we need this, and can it be done a better way? So thank you.
governor, a Democrat legislature back in 2010, used the same data as we're using today. It was never questioned then by either the legislators or the governor or by the system, but now it's being, you're trying to discredit the, the Mason's report card data. So that's a bit disingenuous. The Department of Ed ultimately is responsible to, to uh, answer for our scores. But the AEAs hold all the cards. They have the resources. They have the authority. The DE does it. What most people do not know, up until about 25 years ago, this was in the Department of Education. It was taken out, farmed out to the AEAs, and now we have greater problems than we had before, and the proposal is to bring it back into the DE. So, to your question about who's keeping track, very qualified people in the Department of Education, the ones that are responsible for getting our scores up, will be in charge. I think that's a good thing. Again, I'm not on the Education Committee, so I feel now much different before I ever have a chance to really have input on it. But to address your issue, Nathan has been wonderful for us. Yes. So that was even earlier this week for probably an hour at the Capitol. I think all of us have. He's very understanding of the concerns. He's never once had a defensive tone. Um, like so, I mean, he's probably impacted by this, not probably is, he's impacted by this more than anybody in the room, probably more than all of us combined. And he's probably been the least uh, defensive on the yeah. issue that anybody else has talked to. So thank you for that, Nathan, because that makes it easier to want to engage and, and address issues. But to ask you a question, um, Again, I go back to the administrative side of things. Okay, we have a, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think the payroll person in our AA has a compensation package of 230,000. Okay, do we need nine of them? Do we need nine of all of these high level people, high paying people? Because the way I look at it, if we can combine some of that, there's a crap load of money that's freed up to hire people that are working with your son in, in the schools. I mean, we're not, I don't think I've ever heard a number budget cut slicing the AEA's money. I've never heard that. I, maybe I've missed it, but I haven't heard that as an underlying issue here. It's, it's, and if we can find efficiencies and improve things to hire more people to get them into the schools, to raise the scores that Ken's talking about, why not we want to at least look at that as an option? Thank you. Okay, we are getting close to the time that we need to wind things up. I've got a hard stop here because the soundboard is leaving at 9.30. Oh. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, what I would do is I would encourage you, if anyone wants to talk to the legislators after the event, there will be the opportunity to come up here, uh, assuming you don't have something else taking up your time as well. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free to keep the conversation going. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I need to say thank you to everyone who's been here today. I appreciate you being here. I want to say a special thank you to Midwest One Bank for the supplying of the coffee, to Smoky Row for the providing of our venue today. And I also want to say a special thank you to our legislators. This is a hot seat to be in, uh, and uh, you've, got, you've got to be ready for about anything that comes your way. The next event is going to be on February 10th, in which we will be having perhaps a timely thing, where we will be having representatives of education in Mahaska County sitting at this table. So I welcome everyone to come to that at that time. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.